Hi folks and welcome to the third episode in my series following my adventures learning Rust. In this series I'm following the tutorial Learn Rust with Entirely Too Many Linked Lists. And if you've not seen either of the first two videos of this series, I recommend going checking those out first. In those episodes we implemented a basic stack built around a linked list in Rust. So we defined the data structures, we added a new function to create a list, we added push and pop functions to add and remove elements to the list, we added a peak function to look at what the current element at the head of the list was, and lastly we added a drop function to clean up when we were finished with the list. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to add some initial tests for the code that we've already written. And then once we've got that and the tests are passing locally, we're going to automate the process of running those tests on each commit to the code by using GitLab CI. So let's start looking at the testing section of the tutorial. So this in the tutorial is happening before writing the drop function, but I went ahead and wrote that last time. So yeah, this is where we're up to. So we've got our push and pop functions. I've actually gone ahead and implemented peak and drop as well. So the tutorial's telling us that Rust and Cargo support testing as a first class feature. So testing is very, very well supported in Rust, which is excellent to see. And the way we write our tests is we add a test module to our source file, and then we mark each test function with this test attribute here. So Let's go ahead and do that, and we will call the function basics, though I may rename it as we move further on. So, belief our implementation of the list and our implementation of the drop trait. We're going to add our mod test, and within our mod test, we're going to add our first test case called basics. And there's no arguments to this function, so that's fine. And interestingly, Visual Studio Code has a little run test hyperlink here, so we might give this a try once we've got some test code written in here. So the test in the tutorial starts off by creating a new list and then asserting that if we try and call pop with an empty list, we get nothing in return. So I'm just going to implement these two lines. That should be enough to get a test case that actually compiles and passes. So we're going to say let mute test list equals list new. And then we're going to say assert equal test list dot pop is equal to non. So in theory, that should be enough to work as a test case. Let's see what happens if we try to build that. Interesting. That does seem to have built. Cool. Let's see what the tutorial says. So I think I was a little misled there. If I go back to my code, cargo build isn't going to build test cases. We need to do cargo test in order to build and run test cases. And now we see a compile failure. So list here is not found in this scope. So within mod test, we actually don't have the list type within this module. So once we start splitting things into modules in Rust, even if they're modules defined in the same file, they are completely different namespacing scopes. And if we want to use something from a higher level module, we do need to add a line with the, the use statement in order to pull that in. So we're going to say use 
and I think it's super to refer to the essentially the parent context, the parent module here. So we're going to grab list from that parent context. And now we actually have a warning saying that we have an unused import. And okay, so this is in the tutorial where it adds the use statement for our list. And here is the same warning that we see. So the tutorial's telling us that the test module here is actually always being built, whereas the test case isn't. So at the minute, this test module is always being built and the use super list statement is always being built. But this test case is only being compiled when we're actually running cargo test. So if we're running cargo build, this statement here will actually do an unused import. So we're going to use this config marker here and say config test. Don't know if that's the right way of writing that. Let's have a look in the tutorial. Okay, so it's hash square brackets config brackets test. So we were close. So square brackets config brackets test. So this says only build this code when config test is enabled. And hopefully now that will get rid of the warning and we should have a test that will pass. So we have one passed test in our first module and we have no doc tests. So doc tests are kind of examples in the in any documentation that you write. But right now we're more interested in these more kind of normal tests that are done in test case functions within a test module. So I do want to try out this run test button that we've got in Visual Studio Code. That's probably there because I've got the Rust extensions installed for Visual Studio Code. So let's see what happens. So this gives us a new terminal here, which just executes test with a couple of bonus arguments to just run our single test function. Yeah, that, that, I can see that being quite helpful. When we have several test cases, to just be able to click on one of them to run it. So let's expand this test a little bit. Now I'm not going to call this basics anymore, I'm going to diverge from the tutorial a little bit and say this is our test empty list function. So this is going to test the behaviour of an empty list. So we've got a new list created on the first line of the function which is created empty and then we're checking if you try and pop from an empty list you get none. The other thing we should see for an empty list is if you try to peek on an empty list you should also get none. So those are two test cases for an empty list. Let's give that a quick try. So yep, our one test passes and it's now named test empty list. So it's a little more descriptive. I much prefer this approach and having a few short tests with descriptive function names than just having one test that's called basics. But let's look what other test statements we have in the tutorial. So the tutorial populates a list with three elements and then pops a couple of these elements off, pushes some more, pops some more and sees what happens. So I think this is going to be a useful sequence of tests. So I think I am going to grab most of this and maybe just tweak it a little bit. 
let's take the whole thing as it is, including the test label for this. The other thing I want to do is change this name. I don't really like calling this basics. I'm going to call this test populated list. And I do want to, we can drop this initial empty test because we've covered that above. And we can also test our peak function as we go. So what we're going to do is double up these tests and just make sure that peak when the header list has value 3 peak should be returning 3 but it shouldn't be modifying the list so if we do a pop we should then again see 3 and then we're going to do the same for 2 don't think we need to test peak again here. It's probably worth testing peak at the end a couple of times. So let's test that peak returns none before and after this final pop. So this is just checking that things don't go crazy when we call pop on an empty list. So I'm fairly happy with that as our populated list test case. Let's see what happens now if we run our tests. So now we have two tests passed. We have test empty list and we have test populated list. And both of those pass and it took half a second to do. So this is pretty good. And the way that tests are a first class feature within Cargo and we can just run Cargo test to build and run the tests is really rather excellent. It makes it so easy to add test cases to a library like this. So now we've got some initial test cases for our list. Let's commit this to git. So let's do a git diff just to check that there's nothing crazy about the changes. We've just got additions of lines for our test cases. So I'm happy with this. I'm going to git add this file and commit with a commit message saying add some initial tests. And we're going to push this up to GitLab so we don't lose this. So we've added some tests to our code and we've pushed the commit up to this repository here on GitLab. And what I want to do next is to take advantage of the continuous integration features that are supported by GitLab in order to run these tests on every commit of the project which we push up to GitLab. And this will run on some sort of free cloud instances that GitLab provides and it's all based around Docker. So the idea is you choose an appropriate Docker image that can run your tests and you provide a configuration file which says how to run those tests. And it can also say like what branches you want to test and various other bits and pieces can be configured. But for this simple code here, we just want to get it to run the tests and see whether they pass or fail. So what I'm going to do is look at the CI templates that GitLab provides. So GitLab CI is configured using a YAML file and what they do is they provide you a bunch of template YAML files for various different programming languages and things that you might want to test. Now we're going to look at the Rust template here and we're going to copy the relevant bits of this into our project. So what we need to do is we need to create a GitLab CI YAML file in our repository and start adding lines from this template and we want to add this first line because this is going to say the image that we're going to run this is the docker image from docker hub and for now we're just going to use this rust 
image here and we're going to use the latest version of it. In the future I may want to replace this with a custom container image but for today this is enough to get started with. And we're also going to add this block down the bottom which defines a step called test cargo. Within the block we have a script which is the script that's actually going to run within this Rust container image. So each of these entries in script is going to be run as a command. So yeah, and we want to keep both of these. We do want to print the version info for debugging. That is really helpful. So if we do run into problems, we can see if it may be because there's a new version of Rust or Cargo come in. And then we're going to test our project. I don't think we need the workspace argument because we've just got one project here, but we do definitely want the verbose argument so that we can get as much output as possible. So I'm going to grab all of this. I'm going to take out some of the comments once we've pasted it in, but for now I'm just going to grab all of this. And here in our project, I'm going to create the GitLab CI configuration file. Now the file name that GitLab is looking for is .gitlab-ci.yaml. So it does have a leading dot in front of it, which I do find a little bit confusing, but that's the default that they've chosen, so we're just going to stick with that. And we're just going to paste the text we grabbed from the template. I'm going to drop out as much of the comments as I can because we don't really need to keep all the comments here. And as I said before, I'm going to drop out the dash dash workspace argument from Cargo because we've just got a single project. We've not got any workspace with multiple projects. So I think this is enough to test our project. So the process would be, first of all, this line runs. And on my machine here, this is going to print the versions of Rust and Cargo. I've got version 1.48 of both of these installed. And then we're going to run the tests with the verbose argument. And all this does is just prints in detail the statements that are executed. So these commands look fine and I expect that they will work within this Rust image because you know it's built for building and testing Rust code. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and git add our GitLab CI YAML file. Now we're not going to actually commit this on the dev branch which is the main branch of our project because what I don't want to do is push this up to GitLab and then find that there's something wrong with it or something that we need to tweak. So I'm going to check out a new branch that's called CI and we're going to commit on this branch and we're going to push this branch up just to see if it does actually work on GitLab before we merge this commit to our main development branch. So we're going to commit this saying add initial CI configuration and we're going to go ahead and push this commit up to GitLab. Ah, it does help if we use the right command. So we're going to push this to a new branch. So brilliant, that's pushed up to GitLab. But let's take a look on the GitLab web interface to see what's going on. So if we look at our project and refresh, we see that it's got a little note up the top here saying we've just pushed to this CI branch. So I'm not going to open a merge request, I'm just going to take a look at this CI branch. And this top commit here has a little circle showing progress and it says that a pipeline is running. Clicking through on that shows us this pipeline screen. And a pipeline is made up of one or more jobs. So this job here is called test and that is running. So let's dive into the test job itself. And yep, while we've been talking about it, that job has succeeded. 
But I do want to click through onto this and just have a look at the log output. So this is the log output that GitLab has captured from running our tests. And it's pulled the Rust latest image that we said in our configuration file that we wanted to use. And it's gone ahead and executed the commands in our script. So they were first of all to print the versions of Rust C and Cargo, and then to run our tests with the dash dash for both argument. And we see here that it said running two tests. Our two test cases ran and both of them passed. So that's looking pretty good. That was happy. And what it's gone and done, if I go back to branches and look at this CI branch, it's given our commit a nice green tick to say that the test's passed. So that's excellent. That's what we want to see when we make changes to this project in the future. We want to be able to see a nice green tick on GitLab saying that it ran our tests and the tests passed. And hopefully that will help us catch any potential bugs in future changes that we make to the project. So to finish off, I could create a merge request, go through the merge request process on GitLab, but I'm actually just going to check out the development branch on my local clone and merge the CI branch into here without using a merge commit. It's just going to do a fast forward merge and we're going to push this up to GitLab. And this will actually go ahead and run the test again because GitLab CI doesn't really know whether there's some reason why it might now magically fail when it had succeeded before. So again we're going to see that the pipeline is running. If I can click through this quick enough we might actually see some output here. So it's just waiting while it's downloading the container image onto the Docker executor that's going to run our tests. So this can take a couple of seconds. And now it's pulling our code down from the Git repository. And it kind of flashed for a second there and then it's finished. So once it had the correct Docker image, it really didn't take long to run these tests. So that's excellent to see. And if we go back to our main project front page, we can see a nice green tick on the head commit of our main branch. So last thing we're going to do, we're just going to do a little bit of cleanup. We're going to remove the CI branch now that we've finished with it. So we're going to use git branch dash d CI and we're going to push an empty branch to CI in our git remote. So now we've just got, if I refresh the GitLab page, we've just got one branch called dev and we've got a nice green tick on it. So that's where I wanted things to be. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the Rust format tool, which can put some Rust source code into kind of standard formats that you've not got any arguments over whether things should be invented with tabs or spaces and whether brackets should be at the end of the line or at the start of the next line, anything like that. So the Rust format tool can be invoked through Cargo and it's got a couple of options that we can use. The one we're going to use first is just the option to check the current code and to report a diff of anything that the tool would change if it was given permission to do so. And the return code is going to tell us whether Rust format is happy with our code. So we run that using cargo fmt and we want to pass an extra argument to the Rust format tool itself and we do that using a double dash separator and then the argument we want to pass to the tool itself. So this is going to run Rust format in its checking mode. And what it's done, let me open this up a little bit, it's given us a diff here showing that the preferred format for this little block of code inside our peak function 
is going to be to just put these expressions on the same line as the match expressions. We don't need these curly brackets because we only have a single expression for each arm of the match. We don't really need these blocks. And if we look at the return code of this tool, we're going to see it returns 1, it returns non-zero, so it has told us that this has failed. And failure here just means that the code isn't in the canonical format that Rust format would put it into. So before I go ahead and fix this, what I want to do is actually automate the process of running this check on each commit that's pushed up to GitLab. So looking at our GitLab CI YAML file, we're going to add this as a separate job. So this will allow it to run in parallel and it will allow us to see um, fairly clearly which steppers, which steps have passed and which steps have failed. So we're going to add this as a thing called Rust format and within this block we are going to add a script like we have in the previous block and this script is just going to run exactly the command we just did. So let me grab hold of that. And that's it. So to explain this a little more clearly, each of these top level blocks after our image statement is defining a job. And we'll see these in the GitLab CI interface once they run. And then each job just has a script saying what commands are going to run. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this cargo label out here because it's a little unnecessary and this to me it just looks a little cleaner that we've got a job called test and a job called Rust format. So I am expecting this Rust format check to fail for now, which is absolutely fine because we're then going to add another commit to fix this afterwards. So I am just going to live dangerously and do this straight in our main development branch. We're going to add our GitLab CI file and we're going to commit this with a commit message saying run Rust format in CI. And we're going to push this to GitLab and see what happens. So if I look at this here on GitLab, our CI pipeline is running. And our CI pipeline consists now of two jobs, one called test and one called Rust format. And if we give this a minute or so, it will give us some results. So now we see the results for our pipeline and we see that the test passed, but Rust format failed. So if we click into Rust format, we can see what's going on here. And this is a different failure to the one I thought I would see. Interesting. So Rust format is actually not installed in the Rust Docker image that we used. So that's that's a bit of a shame. We're gonna for now we're just gonna manually install that as part of our script. So we can actually add our commands in a block that's called before script. And this is kind of it. it's a script that runs before script, which sounds a little unnecessary. But let me pop these commands in here and then I'll just explain that for a second. So really this just gets merged into one script when it gets executed by GitLab CI but it does kind of put some boundaries on things so we know the script is the thing we actually want to run and this under before script is just set up commands that are needed to get us into the right state actually has nothing to do with the code that we want to check and it's a good marker that in future we want to really remove this installation command. We really want to modify this Docker image that we're running and make sure that the Docker image we're going to use has Rust format already installed so we don't need to do this. Because this is going to take a little longer than we would want to add, do this installation every time we want to check the code. But for now, this is okay. Let's add this and 
I'm going to see if I can amend this commit. So I'm going to do git commit amend no edit. So our previous commit becomes run rust format in CI. And we're going to push this and we're going to force the change. I actually have on GitLab disabled the branch protection that's enabled by default. So I've gone and disabled branch protection for our default branch because I do, while I'm doing these tutorial videos and rocking through things, I do want to be able to forcibly push changes to that Git repository. So let's go back and let's see what the results of this pipeline is. So looking at our pipeline on GitLab, we're in the same state. We see that the Rust format step has failed, the test has passed. But if we look in the log output for the Rust format job, it's actually a little bit different. So now we have installed Rust format and we've ran this Rust format check. We've got the same output that we saw locally where it's saying we can replace these match arms within our peak function with a simpler version and it returned one because that code could be improved as it's shown us. So what we're now going to do is we're going to go ahead and run Rust format to clean things up and push the results up to Git and see if we get a green tick. So what we're going to do is we're just going to run cargo fmt to run Rust format with no arguments. So running this with no arguments actually just makes the change directly. So now if we do git diff, it's actually gone and it's edited our code. So we don't need to make this change manually. We can just run Rust format. We can add those changes to git. We can commit it with a commit message saying clean up code to please Rust format. And we can push that up to GitLab. So if we look at the pipeline results on GitLab, we now see that both jobs have passed. Our Rust format job has passed, it's looking good. And the output here, there's just no output from Rust format dash dash check, but it does return zero, showing that it is happy with our code. So this is a good place to be again. We have a nice green tick on our head commit. So that's it for this video. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch it. I hope you've learn a couple of things from it. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and please feel free to subscribe to the channel so that you will see when the next episode in this series goes live. I also welcome any comments you want to leave. It'd be great to see what sort of things you'd be interested to see in the future. So thank you very much again and until next time, goodbye.